I see a question about not everyone received a link. Terry team, or would y'all be able to post a link here? Give everyone a few more minutes. Thanks, Natalie. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. And welcome to our first Terry Talk. I'm Brittany Chitwood. And I graduated with my BBA in accounting in 2014 and my master's in accounting in 2015. I was also a Leonard Scholar, class of 2014. And I've been working at EY's assurance practice in Atlanta for the last five years. And I'm on my third year on the Terry College Young Alumni Board. And I'm serving as the events committee chair this year. So before I hand it off to Mary to kick off the program, I wanted to cover a few logistics for the program today. So as you've probably figured out by now, all of you guys are video off and muted for the duration of the talk today. However, we do want to hear any and all questions you may have, so please send those over in the Q&A. So if you look at your Zoom screen, you should see a little Q&A icon at the bottom, so please send all questions through that Q&A chat, and we will address those as they come up, and we'll also have some time for questions at the end of the program today. I also wanted to highlight a request that our Terry team sent out to everyone who registered earlier this week about sharing your success stories. We have a lot of awesome people in our Terry network, and I'm sure all of you have some examples of ways that your teams and leadership in your companies have done great jobs being great leaders in this virtual world. So if you haven't already shared a success story with our Terry team before today, please feel free to also post that in the Q&A, and we will share a few of those at the end of the program today. So our goal is to wrap up at like two o'clock and have some time, about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. So now I'll hand it off to Mary to kick it off. Great, thank you, Brittany. So my name is Mary Richardson. I work in the investment management division at Goldman Sachs and have been with Goldman for about 10 years now. And prior to that, I worked in finance in the Washington DC area. I graduated from Terry in 2004. I was also a leadership scholar and I've stayed connected with the college by serving on the Young Alumni Board for a number of years before moving on to the Alumni Board. So um, Brittany and I are both really excited to have Dr. Don Addison join us for today's program. Uh, Dr. Addison is a lecturer within the Institute for Leadership Advancement at Terry. And prior to finding his way to us at Terry, Dr. Addison was a senior vice president at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, where he was focused on leadership development and designing programs and strategies to support executives that oversaw 20,000 employees globally. He also co-founded Global Business Solutions, which was a team of senior consultants who counseled large corporate clients on strategies to implement and sustain large scale change across an organization. So as if that wasn't enough, uh, you also, Dr. Addison, started teaching, and I know you spent 10 years designing and delivering courses to students in undergraduate, graduate, and doctoral programs across the Southeast. So needless to say, you have a passion for organizational development and driving strategic change to improve an organization's health and performance. So I think Brittany and I both agree that you are the perfect person for today's conversation, given your experience in both academia and uh, corporate America. So welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Awesome. So uh, kind of the first question I wanted to ask you, uh, Dr. Addison. So when I've been kind of sharing experiences and stories with my colleagues and also executives I've worked with, um, I think I've realized that a lot of people um, kind of miss the difference between being a good leader versus just being good at day-to-day -day management. 
So can you kind of help clarify that distinction between leadership and management for us? Well, thanks, Brittany, for giving me that opportunity. So when I think about management, I'm thinking about the coordination and administration of, uh, of tasks or work to meet a goal. So that would involve things like planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. Now, when we focus on leadership, in my mind, that's talking about influencing, inspiring, and motivating people to reach a common goal. So that's how I draw a differentiate or I differentiate between the two. And I'm glad you kind of called that out because I think that if people are hopping on this uh, video telecast or whatever to kind of find out what's the best ways to get people to leverage a specific technology, uh, they won't get it here today. Exactly. Thank you. I think, um, Dr. Asin, you um, had shared a few slides. Um, would you like us to pull them up? Well, well, I think one of the things we were talking about also, bef before we get there, I think it makes sense. I think we had talked a little bit just about um, leadership and the pandemic, but it may make sense. Yes, go ahead and bring the slides up. Actually, yeah, because I, I do know that, um, you know, what be interesting to hear your perspective on what you've what you've been surprised by during the pandemic especially as it relates to corporate leadership yeah I, I i tell you what i've had the opportunity to actually through our executive education department they've had the opportunity to keep me very active in the practitioner community and especially over the last several months all through the spring i've had an opportunity to re to meet with uh, regional as well as national level groups and committees and things. And it really shocked me when I had an opportunity to speak with a lot of these groups and what kind of jumps to the top of my mind in terms of surprises specifically is the number of, number one, fixed mindsets I've come across of leaders as well as um, negative momentum. And, and, and I'll give you one example that is top of mind. I had an opportunity to speak in front of several leaders of some of the largest power utility co-ops throughout the Southeast. And this was probably around March or April timeframe. And it was interesting because the first five to 10 minutes of the call was all about gloom, doom, disruption, et cetera. And I just listened for a while and then kind of stopped the call and I said, hey folks, let me ask you a question. If Six months ago, somebody had interviewed you and asked you, does your organization have the ability to convert from uh, bricks and mortar operations to a virtual operation in the span of a week? Would any of you on this call think you could have done it? The call went dead and light bulbs started going off because I think what people realized was, hey, oh my gosh, we're sitting up here moaning and groaning, but we just did a major strategic pivot. And it was at that time that I think they started to have a little bit of a change in mindset. And so along those lines, I had an opportunity to speak with a few more companies, a few more committees, and I started seeing this dynamic, once again, mindset, as well as a negative momentum around change that I developed, along with my partner, Troy Montgomery, who also teaches in the Terrier College of Business, we actually developed some slides to kind of help companies better understand these dynamics. Because once you understand mindset and momentum of change, you're in a better position to improve your organization's, your organization's adaptability, so to speak. So yeah, why don't we take a look at the slides, Mary, thanks. That'd be great, because I know, I think everyone's been surprised by how adaptable people have been during all of this. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because I'm glad to hear it because obviously people only reach out to uh, University of Georgia for support or executive education when they're experiencing the problem. So it's good to know that some people are out there thriving, but taking it back to COVID-19, as I step back, as I, I'm a social scientist at heart, one of the things I noticed was behaviors or reactions which fell into three buckets. Now, first off, I want to make it very clear. We realize that we are in unprecedented times and things, but also this is a very serious situation we're, we're facing. You know, first pandemic in 100 years, et cetera. Now, once we all have reacted and realized we're in very serious times, 
I would notice reactions within three buckets. Number one, oh no, we're in trouble, we're doomed, uh, uh, close down business. Bucket number one. Bucket number two, okay, hold on folks, let's hang in there. If, if we just persist and just change a few things, we'll get back to normal and business as we knew it faster than you can think. And, and, and just, we'll get there, just hang in there, things will get back to normal. But then there was a third bucket. And the third bucket was very interesting because these were the folks who were like, okay, this is in front of us, let's cut through this, let's get her done and learn and grow from this. And it was very interesting because I mentioned my partner, Troy Montgomery, Dr. Montgomery and I, and we were talking and it was very interesting because one of the things that um, anybody will tell you, and I'm sure I've got a lot of current uh, students and past students on the, uh, in the session right now is, I am not a technologist. I'm allergic to technology. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so nobody felt more angst than I did once we realized we had to move to a virtual platform. However, once I saw that it was gonna happen, it's time to embrace it. It's time to cowboy up, handle your business, et cetera. And what I was able to do was I said, okay, there's a lot of people who are struggling with this. I'm gonna hop on this horse, ride this horse as long as it'll take me because I know that technology is a wave of the future. And a lot of my peers at other universities were really struggling with this. And they were trying to push back, trying to do everything but lean into it and learn and grow, et cetera. It was also around the same time that I also started thinking, I said, hold on, wait a minute. I'll be working from home more. What does that mean? Well, I can cook more, I can make better meals. I can add another workout in my day because I get about a half hour back because I've got a 15 minute commute. So once again, just looking for ways that I could capitalize on the situation. And then as a business person started thinking, okay, people are gonna be out there panicking and unloading assets left and right. So within the span of two days, I bought two properties, a new pickup truck, a uh, kayak, a slow cooker, and I was ready to rock and roll. But once again, positioning myself in a manner where I'm gonna make the most of this time. And my partner, Troy Montgomery, did the same exact thing. And it was at this time, we started having a discussion just around mindsets. So let's take a close look at mindsets. Mary, would you go to the next slide, please? Sure. Perfect. And as I may have mentioned, I mentioned the fixed mindset that a lot of the chief executive officers had on the call that I attended. And what I mean specifically by fixed mindset is people were like, oh no, here's a challenge. I don't want to deal with it. For those Winnie the Pooh fans out there, these are all the Eeyores out there. Like, oh no, the, why is this happening to us, et cetera. And these are the people who express frustration. How could this happen now? I was in the middle of this technical implementation or this merger. Oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Well, complaining about it isn't going to fix anything. And the reality of it is when you have a fixed mindset, you're less likely to adapt to the challenge in front of you. Now, on the flip side, we have the growth mindset. And as the slide lists up there, people who want to be challenged, the effort and attitude determine everything along the lines of your attitude determines your altitude. But also when I'm frustrated, I persevere or, hey, I can learn and adapt to anything. So it's when we talk about these mindsets, although Carol Dwick actually performed the research and really brought these ideas of growth and fixed mindset to the uh, uh, popularize it, I should say, these mindsets can not only be held on an individual basis, but on a collective basis as well. So just think about it, right? If you have a team that has a fixed mindset, there's a very low probability that you're gonna have a lot of growth. Conversely, if you have a team that demonstrates a growth mindset, they're curious, they're ready to rock and roll. They're looking for new ways to do things. So along the lines, let's move to the next slide because the next slide will give us something uh, termed the momentum of change. And uh, realizing that I'm now teaching at an SEC school, I had to use the whole uh, uh, football imagery here because I'm sure everybody will get it. Um, now, when we talk about momentum of change, and we talk about energy in and around a disruption of sorts. So when we talk about negative momentum, this was demonstrated 
by the reaction of the executives on the call when I got on, when they were coming, man, I can't believe this happens now, it couldn't be the worst time, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look at the slide here, we see a player. The player doesn't have his helmet on, he's isolated. He is not participating, obviously experiencing some extreme emotions. And when you have players like that on your business team, guess what? You're not positioned to succeed. That said, let's take a look at the stagnant. And what I mean by stagnant, these may be people who, when uh, they heard about COVID, they're like, okay, yeah, this is not good. Well, let's just kind of hang in there and we'll see what's gonna happen. And when we look at the imagery here, what do we see? We see people dressed, they're on the sidelines, they're watching the game, they ain't doing nothing yet, but they're kind of waiting to see what's going to happen. And maybe if called upon, then they'll react and kind of join the game. Now, going to the third bucket that I discussed earlier, we've got positive momentum. We've got fully engaged, full participation. We've got positive emotion. We've got people working together. And it's that energy that teams, groups, and collectives who are actually working together and have that common goal, these are the types of dynamics that lead through breakthrough innovation and success. Next slide, please. I like how you have the Georgia football players for the breakthrough of continued success. Yeah, hey, 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 I'm learning. <laughs> I'm, I, I've only been here, I've only been here two years, but one thing, man, you don't step between the bulldog and their football, that's for sure, you know? <laughs> so with that, wrapping it all together, let's talk about adaptability. And all adaptability is, is the capability of adjusting to new conditions. So when we look at the matrix up here, we look at the intersection of mindset, specifically growth and fixed mindset, but also momentum of change, positive and negative. And I'll, I wanna take a closer look at each of these quadrants. So if we look at the quadrant that's labeled zero, that means zero adaptability. And what do I mean by that? When you have a team that has a fixed mindset that goes, oh no, I don't wanna be challenged, I can't learn anything, and there's negative momentum that is along the lines, this change is bad, guess what? You got zero adaptability. I'm not a mathematician, but I can just about guarantee that one. Now, moving to the section labeled low. This is indicative of a team that has a growth mindset, which means they're open to new ideas. They're ready to do things. Okay, I think I can learn and grow, but there's negative momentum. And what do I mean by that? That may be a team that is like, wow, we might be able to do it. Ah, but you know what? We failed in the past. Or, Gee, that idea that Sally came up with, with was super, uh, but you know what? We never get resources here in our organization. So once again, this is a less than ideal situation. Now the adaptability is low here. If we move across diagonally and we look at the sector that's titled medium, this is indicative of a group that has a fixed mindset, which means they may not be ready to um, learn and grow, but there's a positive momentum within the group, okay? So they're not gonna birth anything, but they've got a situation where they're good as a collective, there's positive energy through, through togetherness, through our positive experiences, just through our strong relational ties, I think we can get through anything. So this is the type of team that may be a late adopter. They're not gonna come up with anything, but when the good idea comes from another group, they say, hey, let's hop on board. And we'll close with where it says high. And once again, high adaptability. This is indicative of a team that has a growth mindset, meaning they're looking for challenges. They're ready to embrace challenges. Those of you familiar with Six Sigma may be familiar with the idea of continuous improvement. So these are groups that continuously attempt to improve processes, procedures, um, just the way they work, but also there's positive momentum. Maybe there's healthy internal competition where they try to outdo each other and they celebrate short-term wins and things. This is where innovation happens. So when we think about this, the key thing here is leadership. When you have a leader who, as I said earlier, can inspire and motivate these teams, but also cultivate a growth mindset and generate positive momentum of change, that increases the probability that your team, department, or organization will adapt and thrive during times or periods of 
reactive change like we're in right now. So I'll say this is important because obviously getting on Zoom, Skype, or Caltour, or whatever the case may be, that's extremely important, but that's a tactic. And what a lot of leaders will talk about is, how do I get my people to do this? How do I get my people to do that? That's indicative of a collective where people are, they have a fixed mindset and or negative momentum of change. So what I talk to leaders about is, as a leader, it's not about the tactics. It's about inspiring and motivating those people. And once you inspire and motivate them, guess what? They're going to be the ones coming to you going, hey, I want to install Zoom on my computer. Or, hey, I have a new idea how we can spend more time together, even in periods of social distancing. So once again, as a leader, cultivating that type of environment is only going to benefit you, your team, and your organization. So I think we've got a, a, a quote here on the back end with the next slide. Great. I was going to ask for a, um, I, I think it would be helpful for all of us to see an example of a leader with that mindset. Oh, great. Okay. Well, I'll get through this slide real quick. Then I'll, then we'll take a look of, of, at, at a very practical example. Great. Now, when you look at this example, well, I'll give everybody a chance to read this slide here. And what I liked about the slide while you're reading is the fact that it's from Citrix and it's talking specifically about the pandemic. And the quote comes from the CEO, their top leader. And what I'll close with is, the quote sums up what I've been sharing so far. So, in essence, David Henschel hopes organizational leadership will continuously motivate their teams to focus on the future and embrace chaos, try new things, and meet new challenges to create and drive positive change. That's the key here. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to leave you hanging, Mary. Let's go to the next slide. Let's take. Well, that was a good example. I like that. <laughs> let's, let's, let's take a look at the slide here because one of the things that I've talked about is I'm going, oh my gosh, I've got all this blah, blah, momentum of change, et cetera. But people are going to be like, yeah, that's great. How does this work? Or give me an example. Well, what's interesting is on March 27th, uh, Dean Ayers, Put out a communication and it and it and just hit me uh, a couple days ago and actually just so nobody panics I ran up I ran this by Dean Ayers and I said hey can I have your approval to broadcast this and he was fine <laughs> the reality of it is when we talk about a leader who actually can cultivate a environment that includes a growth mindset as well as generate positive momentum here's a communication that I think is short but it covers several key aspects of what a leader is attempting to do during these times. So what I'm going to do, I think I've got some notes here, so I won't riff too much. When you look at the first page here, right out of the gates, he clearly acknowledges and calls out the challenge, which is COVID-19. Now, I've seen various leaderships in different forms who don't want to mention it, who don't want to call it up because, oh, that's bad. Well, no, call it out. Nobody's surprised. Everybody gets it. So the reality of it is, calls out the challenge COVID-19 and recognizing the effect it's having on the followers. Notice disruption and anxiety. Once again, calling it out, a lot of leaders don't want to talk about the bad thing. That's not leadership. Now, moving forward, goes on to share, the communication takes a very pointed upturn from there. As he states his mood, he says, uplifted by the cause of, uh, by the cause of that move, which is a sense of purpose and unity. Once again, he's talking about his followers now. So it's not just him, this is the way I feel. It's like, I'm inspired by what you're doing. I'm seeing you folks down here really responding in a positive way. Now, once again, being very honest and transparent, acknowledges the changes and drawbacks. Quote, the move to remote delivery has distanced us physically and uh, then followed by unspoken or unrecognized benefits of opening lines of communication and teamwork in remarkable ways. Think about it. Remarkable has a powerfully positive connotation. So once again, acknowledge it, but shortly thereafter, hey, this may be seen as a problem, but this is a heck of an opportunity we're going. And once again, we're only, what, three or four sentences in? Then he goes on to say, where is it here? Um, he's encouraged by everyone's commitment. And what do we talk about leadership? That collective progress or vision of reaching a goal, all right? 
and quote our, once again, the collective, not just him and it's not the other, it's us as a community, the Terry community, our ability to, to rise to this new and calls out a challenge. It doesn't say a problem, but a challenge. A challenge is something which can be overcome. And quote, deliver the best possible education and learning experience, unquote. He didn't say survive. He didn't say hang in there. He said, deliver the best possible education, which implies that, hey, we can do better than what we originally planned to do. So once again, setting that bar high, building that momentum. Next slide. Now, to the students and customers, he shares that Terry is steadfast in our commitment. What does that mean? We're talking about unwavering, resolute, okay? We're not questioning, hey, we're, 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 we're kind of gonna do our best here. Nobody ain't trying to do their best. We got a job to do, right? Then he acknowledges it's going to be different. That's extremely powerful. It's going to be different, meaning change is coming. I'm not saying it's gonna be the same, but things are gonna be different but then calls out the unmistakable opportunity to pull together and accomplish goals in front of us. Once again, rallying towards a vision. Um, and once again, us as in the collective, the community, we're, we've really called out the, the undergraduate and graduate students in addition to the faculty and staff who, were, who, who received the first, um, um, who, who the first part of communication was catered to. Then he gives us very specific guidance to quote, narrow your focus and prioritize, advocate for yourself, communicate clearly and directly, and empathize with the circumstances other face, others face. So once again, care, nurture, help your brother, your sister out. We're all in this together. Um, he closes by asking folks to quote, remain patient, supportive, and unified as we navigate. Now, calling on patience, calling on tolerance, saying, hey, this isn't gonna be easy, things are gonna change, it's gonna be different, but let's empathize, let's be patient, we can get through this. And then I love the term navigate as it suggests the notion of going through uncharted territory, which is true, we've never been here before. Um, he goes on to reference tenacity and attacking each day to see the, seize opportunities. So not only was he talking about the vision, but now he's talking about day by day, we got to do this. Day by day, you got to bring your lunch. Talk about hunker down, you're talking about the balling, right? This, this is where you get in and get the job done. And then he closes with, quote, we will persist through this, and here's the key, be stronger for it. Not, well, things will get back to normal, hang in there, we're gonna be okay, and we'll pick it back up in 2024. It's like, no, we can be better off once we get through this whole thing. So. To tie everything together, leaders who, number one, generate positive momentum towards change, number two, cultivate a growth mindset, they create an adaptable organization, and adaptable organizations will embrace those tactics, those techniques and routines that we're calling upon in these unprecedented times, and do so more, more broadly and faster than organizations who are less adaptable. So when you think about it, adaptable organizations don't have to answer the questions, how do I convince my people to use Zoom or MS Teams? Because their employees are already doing it on, on their own. Yeah. And, and, and Mary, I think I remember when we were talking, both of us being from um, having backgrounds in banking, financial institutions, I think you had a pretty good example too, didn't you? Yeah, I, um, it just, this made me think of uh, my experience in my company, just from a communication standpoint that stood out because at the time when COVID hit, that was also during obviously extreme market turmoil. So that certainly elevated the stress level that we were all feeling as advisors uh, in the Atlanta office. And so what I thought was interesting, um, you know, I was impressed with the communication from senior leadership, but especially at the region level, because our region head started to do Zoom calls. So that encouraged us to get familiar with Zoom very quickly. But we, we did Zoom calls every day for the first week or two. And that eventually tapered off to three times a week and now um, once a week. But what I thought was smart on her part is rather than using those Zoom calls just to share communication from the broader firm, she brought in guest speakers every day to cover different topics such as, you know, what questions are the advisors being asked by clients? How are they addressing that? How are we all staying on top of market knowledge so that we can pass it along to our clients in a timely way? And so 
I thought that doing those Zoom calls and bringing in guest speakers kept us with a kind of positive mindset and it created a channel for her to distribute the communication but in a way that was very helpful because we wanted to hear and share best practices amongst all of our colleagues. So we were staying engaged from that standpoint. Um, so I just think for me personally, the, the communication was, was key. That's a good example. Yeah. Um, well here, all right, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can see faces a little better. One thing, um, Dr. Addison, that one of our attendees, Julie, brought up was that Dean Ayers said physical distance, not social distance. So, and how that kind of talks about how we are social beings. So it's pretty much impossible to always be socially distant and we need that social interaction. Um, so thanks, Julie, for sharing that. I thought that was great. No, yeah, definitely. Well, well, well one, one of the things I'd like to say is, is all my students are gonna be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you've seen this again. None of us is as smart as all of us. I have a little bit of insight. Mary's got some. So as we kind of go through this discussion, if there's people out there who are attending who have some insights and best practices, please type it in the chat. And uh, Brittany, keep your eyes out and see what we can do to share. Yeah, so that's a perfect segue. I think now that we've kind of heard the theory, I think like people are asking the question, like how do we practically capitalize on this virtual um, environment and have that growth mindset on a day-to-day -day basis, both, both as like technical leaders in our organizations, or if you're just, just like me and only five years in, like how can I be a leader and have this growth mindset in my organization as well? Okay, so, so we're talking about routines and tactics now, right? Yes, okay. um, and but also how to like motivate and inspire and be a good leader at all levels, um, or as okay. a student too, for those students on the call. Okay. Well, let's talk, let's, let's start in the business room first. And we want to talk virtual. One of the things, and obviously I'm an old guy, retired to come work here, older than I look, but the reality of it is in certain organizations, there's a culture of at your desk early, stay until the late hours, okay? And a lot of times that culture can derail a culture that is performance-based because ideally what, where, a, a performance-based culture, when they have to transition to a virtual sort of uh, a work environment, it's a lot easier because people aren't worried about, I'm not being seen, my boss won't see me at 7 a.m. Because a lot of times we reward people for activity. Wow, well, that Joe, he's, he's in the office at 7 a.m. every day and, and doesn't leave till 6 p.m. That's not the right question. The question is, what's Joe doing? <laughs> Is Joe completing his work, right? And, 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 and in a performance-based culture, you have leadership that really values people getting the job done, making sure that people who need directive leadership says, okay, here's what you need to do, here's how you need to do it, here's what it needs to be done. And the more senior people, just giving them the overall goal and what needs to happen. And then when you have that sort of performance-based culture, you're not worried if somebody's when they're at their desk, are they working now, et cetera, because the culture is one in which people are held accountable for getting the job done. So the number one thing, well, I shouldn't say number one, but one of the top things that helps an organization through an effective transition to a virtual working environment is by cultivating and nurturing that performance-based culture. Um, the other thing that I'll say in terms of leadership is, Everybody focuses on what, what's going away. And once again, that's what we call a deficit-based mindset, okay? It's hard to maintain an upbeat attitude. And I like to shift it to something along the lines of appreciative inquiry or positive psychology. So rather than what are we losing, what are we gaining? Well, here's what we're gaining. Guess what? You, you're not getting as many drive-bys. And what I mean by that, not drive-by as in West Coast drive-bys, drive-bys as in the business <laughs> drive-bys where somebody pokes their head in the office. Hey, Mary, how was your weekend where you're trying to get the job done? Mm -hmm. You've got a meeting with a client. Or, uh, hey, you want to have an extended lunch today? All those interruptions are now better managed when you're working at home. So it gives you more time in your day. Also, what's another benefit? Those of us who um, live close to work, 15 minutes, I gain 15 minutes there, 15 minutes back. I just put a half hour in my day. That said, Mary, uh, I used to live in the D.C. area. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're chuckling. So those of you 
actually around Atlanta, DC, LA, Chicago know that some people are gaining as much as two and three hours yeah. back. That's huge. That absolutely is, right? So, so when you think about how much time that you're giving back, that's time to do the additional planning that's necessary, not only just to manage the meeting, but you can be much more purposeful and intentional with your interactions. There's benefits to that because sometimes as a leader, you can be overtasked. Some of us become withdrawn and you always wanna be uh, presenting your best to your people. But now you can manage when you're seen and how you interact with your folks. There's nothing more powerful. So you can bring your A game rather than having a bad call and walking down the hallway uh, to get something to eat and running into that, that needy employee who's always asking you questions. You want to try to be helpful, but you're like, all right, come on, guy, you can do this on your own. But now you can have those purposeful interactions and say, hey, you can meet with those people maybe for a half hour every Tuesday and be better prepared and have a well-structured agenda where you can really focus on helping your employee be all they can be. So there's a lot that can be gained here. Here's what I will share though also that may be some less popular sort of tactics and routines. Because one of the things people were starting to see is um, people are starting to miss that social interaction, right? Mm -hmm. And some of the tactics I've seen uh, people apply, and I've been part of these, uh, uh, some of these myself, is uh, virtual lunch and learns. So you're not working, but maybe you watch the same video at the same time, and you can use the chat function and kind of go through. And ideally, it's something that's um, a developmental for the team or something that strengthens social ties, but not necessarily something that's work-related. I tell you another thing that we did um, when I was at Bank of America, I had um, a leadership team which, which oversaw tens of thousands of people. So I had about eight people who were spread around the globe from Europe to India to Dallas, Texas. And what I did was I had a virtual book club. And this was years ago when we all read Jim Collins, Good to Great. Oh, yeah. but the thing wasn't just reading it. It's like, okay, what did you learn and what are you going to do? So I'm a big believer in action. It's really neat. We have a lot of people who can talk. But once again, that's not helping anybody. What did you learn that you can apply to help your employees, to help your team, to help the organization? So there was some accountability and a high degree of action orientation with that exercise. The other thing I've seen people do during this pandemic is some organizations will have uh, smaller teams meet offsite at a park perhaps. And a lot of times it'll be in a pavilion where you can have your laptop up because <laughs> some of us, the laptops and sunlight doesn't work. But then what they'll do is they'll get together outdoors, socially distanced, they can still interact and you're in a park so you really don't have to worry about sensitive information so much and the airflow is there and then afterwards they say hey we're going for a hike or we're going for a, a bike ride or running some canoes perhaps right things like that then um everybody's heard of this one though the virtual happy hour yeah. but the key with the virtual happy hour is doing it themed right and you can have teams come on and you have different themes like great teams through history and your team dress up and give a little bit of report and things like this and nobody has to drive if if uh, if uh, somebody gets uh, if somebody overindulges so to speak so and and then finally I guess a virtual Pictionary too so there's a lot of things that we can do to really not feel so alienated and to also strengthen those social ties I think you're right though dr. Addison that you have to be I didn't realize how much I would miss the the interruptions during the workday but you're right it's powerful that you can control those a little bit more but I still think you need to be intentional with the engagement that you have because even if people act like they don't need it, I feel like people do. Yes. No, no, sure. no, listen, you, you nailed it. And as the people who know me know is like, I retired from banking and can't come here. The reason why I came here was because of students. I'm, I mean, the students are absolutely awesome. So much so that I set aside a full day and I've got my um, graduate assistant, Christina Britt, who is absolutely awesome. And my teammates, helped me, uh, Courtney Aldridge, as a matter of fact, helped, uh, helped me, because there's no way I was gonna do this, do some online, let's call it, not to get technical, thingamajigger, where people can <laughs> sign up, and basically the majority of the day on Wednesdays, people can sign up for 15 minute blocks. So I've rearranged my schedule so I can have that interaction, so people can get on Zoom, et cetera, and I've got time dedicated for that, not 
here and there and scheduling people in, but knowing that I really like that interaction, I have probably a good seven hours, I think six to seven hours set aside on Wednesday where people can sign up for those 15 minute blocks. So if you need that, that may be something you can do and send out a blast email, say, hey, if you wanna meet with me, here's a link, please sign up, love to hear from you. Yeah, that's a great idea. I love that. There's one uh, question that came through that I think is directly relevant to what we were talking about um, from Caitlin. So she asked, many of us shot out of the cannon in March, but burnout and loss of momentum is starting to show up now that we are roughly six plus months in um, to this new world. So she's asking like, how do we stay focused and motivated and continue that, having that growth mindset and positive momentum? Well, I gotta tell you, what I would say is this, I, I don't know if people are still, well, well, a lot of it could be expectations. Now, when she says shot out of the cannon, that implies, and I'm assuming this to be somebody who, who recently graduated. And it, is that correct, you think, or am I Or it there? could be just like everyone's kind of, you had the camaraderie initially oh. when quarantine hit, and we're like, we're all in this together, we're going to get through this. But maybe that was that kind of stagnant mindset at first of like, we're going to wait for things to get back to normal um, yeah, instead well, of capitalizing. Well, listen, that's why leadership is so important because you've got to set the expectations. Guess what? Uh, uh, it ain't going to be back to normal. You're going to have a new normal and things are going to be different. And, and, and a lot of times people hold on to, wow, I wish I could go back to the way things were. And um, I struggled with a little bit of that because one of the things that I don't necessarily like change, but I tell you what, I, I used to have a crew who I worked with 20 years ago and these were some old banking friends and you talk about work hard, but party hard. Wow. Um, but the virtual happy hours we have are just absolutely fun with the different themes. So I think looking for new ways to engage um, and just realizing it may be a while before you can get back together and do things. Now that said, there's certain cities um, where a lot of the establishments are allowing people to get together outdoors and, 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 and do things. I was in Greenville recently and there was a uh, rooftop restaurant called Sips, I think, and I actually had an opportunity to interact with uh, some current UGA students and UGA grads out on the rooftop outdoors totally open socially distanced so so it made sure that i uh was looking out for everybody's health and well-being but at the same time fulfilling that need to be close to people awesome so i think continuing the conversation we want to hear from the attendees so we are actually going to launch a polling question um, for our next discussion topic so i think our terry terry team is going to pull that up so the question is, what is your biggest concern right now being virtual? Um, so there are five options, um, please pick one. The first is just low morale or just maintaining that, those in-person team relationships. Um, productivity during the day, maintaining accountability, I would say for both yourself and your teams. Um, lack of opportunities for FaceTime with leadership and work-life balance. So kind of separating that work and home when you're working from home. So we'll give everyone a minute or so to reply to this. And Brittany, while we are letting people um, submit their responses, I thought it would be fun to share a success story from the Terry community yes. that someone shared a couple days ago. So this is coming from Felicia Con Payton, who is the owner and director of Little Scholars Academy, which is a small nonprofit childcare center in a low income neighborhood. I thought this was a great story. So she said, I have two Georgia lottery funded pre-K programs and I decided to have my students return to school in a traditional setting. It is hard to teach preschool children virtually and even harder in a neighborhood where most children do not have access to electro electronic devices. To keep my staff and parents motivated, I had an outdoor classroom created and we started, um, sorry, a little pop up on my screen. But we, so to keep my staff and parents motivated, I had an outdoor classroom created and we started an early childhood education garden. The garden has been such a success, especially since the neighborhood is a food desert. The outdoor classroom has also made the parents and staff feel safe in the environment. And I have also had an air, air purifying devices and an HVAC, HVAC system to deliver cleaner and healthier air. And I just thought that was such a great example of using this situation, um, being adaptable and creating something new um, that's exciting to everyone with that garden. 
No, I think that's, that's a great idea. And I'll say something before we read this poll. One of the things that just hit me is I, I had missed a lot of social interaction, but I tell you, over the last two months, I've met more of my neighbors in my neighborhood than I had the prior 18 months. These people are out and about. So I've made new friends and things like that. So this may be a great opportunity if you get out and exercise while you're working at home. Uh, talk to some of your neighbors as you pass by and things. It, it, that could help satisfy some of that, that, that need for social interaction. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So we have our polling results. It looks like we have a tie between two, um, between low morale and maintaining team relationships as well as work, as well as work life balance. Um, so maybe you can pick one or both of those, Dr. Addison. Yeah, well, I'll take a first shot at that. But what I also want is I'd love for the participants to kind of weigh in with some of their ideas, because once again, none of us is, is as smart as all of us. So to that end, what I'll say about the work-life balance, what research shows is when you work from home, you should have a dedicated workspace. Mm -hmm. And ideally some place where you can get away and focus. So much so, um, I, when I worked uh, for the bank and I was in Charlotte, I had a dedicated office, often a different section of my home where I could shut the doors and I could really be focused on my work. And then when I actually walked out, I felt like I was at home again because this is a problem that I struggle with now because right now uh, uh, my kitchen table is kind of like my office it, with my small little retiree townhouse now and, 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 and I can't get away from it. So I, that's a real thing, separating that work-life balance. So what I've also um, attempted to do though, too, is I'll start my mornings out, is it, I'm coming down Prince Avenue, I'm trying to get a coffee shop, I don't know if it's called Sips, over there on the left, um, geez, it's by, uh, by, by Agua Lounge or something, but, but what I started to do is I started to get out earlier and I will go to some of these outdoor coffee shops, but once again, I can set up and do my work and focus. So my suggestion would be to make sure you have a dedicated work area that is away from maybe where you eat, entertain, or relax. That could probably help. I also sometimes personally feel like you almost work more. You, you need to be focused on the time that you're allocating to certain things and be willing to shut off. Otherwise, you get burnt out. No, listen, that's, that's huge. When I was at Bank of America, I pioneered the, um, the flexible work uh, program there years ago and what studies show is that a lot of people are worried about their employees working from home. Studies show that folks employees get more work done from home but to your point Mary I think setting those boundaries right that, mm -hmm. that's what the virtual is all about and saying hey I'm going to work from whether it's from 9 until 10 1045 or 945 take a 15 minute break because once again research shows there's a lot of us who work better taking frequent small breaks throughout the day rather than just sitting nine to five. But to your point, Mary, I think you nailed it. It's understanding your behaviors, your preferences, your work style, and making sure you plan accordingly and hold yourself to those schedules as if you were in the office. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think I wanted to look at some of our questions that have come in. So let's see. I like this one from Callan. Um, when thinking of strong leaders, the characteristics of being very charismatic, a trait I think is best conveyed in person is one of the main commonalities. What do you think is the most effective way to convey charisma and personality when you're somewhat limited through a screen? Well, I, I've got to tell you a lot of times when we think about charisma, and, and, and the ability to draw people in with your personality traits, things like this. A lot of times what you can do is through your work environment, maybe you've got some artifacts in your office that may be funny, that, that, that may uh, signify success perhaps. And when you get on the call, making sure you have the right backdrop perhaps, right? A lot of times backdrops or um, making sure you prepare for your audience. Once again, understanding your followers, who you're gonna speak with. There's some people who like to share more. So being able to say, okay, I'm gonna get on the call with Mary, and I know Mary is a type A, she's a doer, so I know that I'm gonna to need to give her 20 minutes to fill me in on what I missed. Conversely, I may have Brittany, who Brittany, I may have to question because she tends to be very modest, 
and I may need to pull some things out of her and she may need more coaching from me. So once again, I think as a leader, the ability to truly understand the people who are on your team and understanding not only what you want to cover in that call, but how you can cover that. Because a lot of times our learning styles and our communication styles are different and being prepared to engage in whatever manner best suits your follower. Right, I think that's great. There was another um, question that I thought was interesting. So one of the one of the individuals who submitted a question said, "What are your thoughts on whether the pandemic will have a permanent impact on the makeup of the workforce? In particular, I'm seeing parents, disproportionately women, exiting the workforce due to lack of child care and having to facilitate at home learning. I think that's a good one." I have to tell you, I see that something, but what, what, once again, the question is, what do I predict and what do I see? Mm -hmm. Here's what, um, here's what I will say. Uh, I will say when companies have the realization that, oh my gosh, our productivity has been the same or even improved, they'll let go of real estate. That goes directly to bottom line. You start letting, you start getting rid of some of that high rent space in the office district man, oh man, you talk about savings and immediate returns. So I think what we'll see is we're gonna start seeing uh, larger corporations over the span of probably the next, I'd say uh, three to 36 months, start letting go of uh, downtown office space. Interesting. I could see that. So one thing, it's not a question, but I liked that Lori brought this up um, as an idea for team engagement besides just Zoom happy hours. Um, team trivia, I think similar to what you were saying, Dr. Addison, about having kind of some sort of content that everyone can rally around, whether that's like a lunch and learn, watching a TED talk together and discussing it or reading a book together. I think trivia could be a fun way to feel like you're in person and kind of collaborating but um, it's, you're not just sitting around in a screen with a cocktail in hand. Yeah, I yeah, think that shows, allows people to show their personality too. Yeah, so thanks Lori for sharing that idea. All right, what other questions do y'all have? Let's see. I have um, actually, Brittany, another success story that's come in. So okay. this is from Jake Candler who said, I work in management consulting and we have utilized virtual team rooms to replicate results generated from all of us being in one place and brainstorming solutions for our clients as they arise. Specifically, we've used virtual whiteboards and scheduled team sessions that are blocked off for this purpose. It allows for maximum efficiency and accountability for each project. That was great. Great idea. Awesome. So another question I see, I think that came through earlier was from Julie. Um, she said, younger people are usually more adaptable than older people. Are our business communities and education communities prepared to recognize that younger people could be the key to helping them be more adaptable um, versus a, maybe a like traditional relationship with younger people, which assumes that they need time to quote, learn how the system works first. Well, my experience, I'm going to turn it over to Mary because, 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 uh, well, well, both you and Mary are still squarely in this, so I don't know why you're asking me this, but, 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 but one of the things that I will share is, as I still have my, uh, my uh, uh, feet in the practitioner world, I think employers get it. Em em employers are really getting the fact that we've got the back of the millennials and the Gen Z. They're a different type, and they bring a lot of talent, a lot of strengths, and whereas back in the 60s, 70s, you had a pretty, what I'll call, um, solidified infrastructure that didn't change. And you would come in out of college and, okay, that you'd get shown the IBM System 36 is what we've used for years, blah, blah, blah. Where you've got undergraduates now coming in who are expert at applications, tools, and techniques that the employer doesn't have. So they're bringing a heck of a lot more to the table than I know I did when I came out of school. So my answer to that is, I think employers are getting it. So Brittany, what are your thoughts on that? 
I mean, I think that my, so I will say EY is fairly young. I feel like most of our um, workforce is pretty young, which is, which is fun. I feel old at 28. So (laughs) um, when I work with a lot of people on my team, but I think, I do think that a lot of companies are recognizing that in order to retain that top talent, they do need to do a little bit of a pivot um, and cater to either having more flexibility in your workday And I honestly think this remote working environment is forcing a lot of these companies to do that and be truly performance based as opposed to hours in the office or Mm -hmm. FaceTime and that sort of thing. So we've seen that too. And actually I saw an interesting stat. Don't quote me on this, um, but that more than half of our population is our our millennials. Um, And that is a big number. And so it has forced our company to be adaptable and to think of ways to engage that younger population to keep them happy. So our benefits have shifted. Um, And and I do think, like Brittany, you touched on this, that how we've been forced to work remotely will probably give a little bit more comfort around working from home when needed um, from time to time. So I think that that's a good shift that's happening because of the younger population. Yeah. So a good next question that Ansley asked is, as a new employee at a hierarchical company, so I guess your old school company, how can you positively impact the culture without being a leader or an executive? Well, one of the things that I will say is this, one of the things that uh, when I would see uh, younger people ascend the ranks at Bank of America faster than most, it was because they could make connections. Let me tell you what I mean by that. They would understand what the strategic goals of their boss were. And within that area of focus, what skills and competencies and capabilities did they bring that were unique that could help their boss reach their goals? So it wasn't so much about um, the company vision, the company mission, but it was about that person who you directed, who, who you reported to, your ability to understand the actions you could take, the information you could bring, the tools that, the unique things that you could bring to help him or her reach their goals or the team's goals. So to be able to have a laser focus and put a high priority on that, that's something that I had seen. I think that's a way sometimes um, 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 new people coming into a team can really make a valued impact. I would also say identify ways to get that in-person reaction or interaction creatively. Um, Like I know I've seen people on my team that are younger than me um, just kind of proactively organize trivia or like your lunch and learns and that sort of thing. I mean, that can really help bring an additional element to your team and also help you get recognized by the leadership of your team. All right. If you have any other questions, please send them in. I think the only other one I see here is from Evan on discussing possible ideas for virtual prospecting of new clients and customers since trust is inherently built best in person. Well, I gotta tell you, I got very little on that. I'm a late adopter when it comes to technology, but, but what I will say, understanding a little bit about human psychology is, we're in the middle of a major shift now. So whereas it used to be in the past, people relied on that face-to-face interaction. There's a lot of culture around the world, a lot of cultures around the world who really work towards that. The, the playing field has been leveled now because we all have to now communicate and interact using uh, a virtual means and technology. So um, I'm not aware of any of the latest tactics, techniques, and things, but Brittany, Mary, what have you guys seen? What what do you think about that question? From a prospecting standpoint in my business um, and investment management, what's been powerful for us is using the research that's coming out of our firm, um, especially as it relates to our market outlook, and just proactively calling prospects to offer up to share that the the expertise um, and and thought leadership, um, even if it's, you know, a market piece, a write-up from our investment strategy group. I found that, especially during the market volatility in March and April, 
that was actually a surprisingly powerful time to reach out to prospects that I hadn't touched base with in a long time because they were interested in the information and what was going on. And so um, I just think if, if that person's company is, is publishing thought leadership or seeing anything interesting in that space in general, create a few bullet points for yourself and call and just offer to share what you're seeing in the industry. I think, Brittany, do we have any more questions? One more just came through um, from Julia. She said, you mentioned that companies might 